Okay, so today I'm very happy to have uh, Stan from Columbia to tell us about the enumerative geometry, geometric representation theory, and the elliptic surface. Thanks. Right, thank you. Um, so uh, as Peng said, uh, the subject of the talk is going to be about those three things, or maybe some uh, element of the symmetric group permutation of them. Basically, I'm going to talk about uh, elliptic surfaces um, and some geometric structures on elliptic surfaces that are going to be important for us to talk. Um, then I'm going to talk about um, certain algebras that um, show up on moduli spaces associated to these surfaces. Um, and then we're going to uh, relate those algebras to the enumerative geometry of counting curves um, in uh, the moduli spaces introduced uh, in the first part of the talk using the algebras introduced in the second part of the talk. So in, for me, an elliptic surface is a um, algebraic variety, which is the smallest dimensional possible uh, for which it admits a Lagrangian vibration. Um, so this is all in the um, language of algebraic geometry. So uh, Lagrangians are going to be holomorphic Lagrangians and our um, varieties are going to be uh, complex varieties. Um, so the fundamental geometric structure for us is going to be a Lagrangian vibration, um, which is a particular type of structure on a two n dimensional complex uh, manifold. Um, so, um, right, so holomorphic Lagrangian vibration is a proper map um, from that manifold to a base, uh, which as a consequence is going to be half dimensional. So if M is dimension uh, 2N and B is dimension N, um, such that the fibers are Lagrangian subvarieties um, of M. Uh, so we can see a picture here, um, which is one of the simplest examples. Um, in particular, it's a, a Lagrangian vibration so that the total space is two dimensions, the base is one dimension, and it's an example of an elliptic surface with an I2 fiber. Um, so it's a, a consequence that um, if you have such a structure on these varieties, uh, then as long as the general fiber is smooth and connected, it's automatically an abelian variety. Um, so in this case, uh, in the two-dimensional case, the fibers are one-dimensional abelian varieties, which are elliptic curves. Um, and then it's also a consequence that the singular fibers, so the generic fiber is going to be smooth, but the singular fibers live over a divisor on the base, uh, called the discriminant, where um, the uh, fibers are no longer smooth, but are able to develop singularities. Um, so I guess I should make a comment that uh, there are sort of more general Lagrangian vibrations that show up in geometric representation theory. So in particular, things like the cotangent bundles of algebraic varieties um, have Lagrangian vibration structures where the fibers are not compact. Um, so, for example, all of the BFN Coulomb branches have Lagrangian vibrations in those sense, uh, but those aren't going to be the um, uh, types of Lagrangian vibrations that we're considering. We're only going to consider those with uh, proper fibers. Um, so, how are we going to study these? Well, we're mostly interested in uh, rational curves, and so we're interested in the, the study of um, the singular fibers of Lagrangian vibrations. So. Um, we want to uh, ignore the nice smooth elliptic curves in the surface case and just study what happens at singular fibers. And the way we're going to do this is to um, contract certain components of those singular fibers. Um, so we're going to factorize all Lagrangian vibration um, into a sequence of maps where the first one um, is a uh, birational contraction map, um, meaning it's a, a birational map. Um, which is surjective uh, with proper fibers. Um, and then uh, we'll study um, symplectic varieties that are in between M and B, and we'll call this structure uh, an example of an intermediate symplectic singularity. Um, so in the example that I drew on the board, where we have you know, two rational curves um, that are uh, meeting in a cyclic configuration, um, an example of an intermediate symplectic singularity is where we contract uh, one of those P1s. Um, so it turns out that whenever you have an elliptic surface uh, with uh, an elliptic curve degenerating into um, two 
uh, rational curves. So in this picture, we're going to draw it as a smooth fiber degenerating here. Um, those rational curves are automatically forced to be minus two curves, um, which are contractible by an analog of Castel Nuovo's criterion, the um, study of elliptic surfaces dating sure. back to sure. this picture is only one rational curve. So there were two in the previous picture. So in the previous picture, we have two rational curves. And what I'm going to study is I'm going to study uh, an intermediate uh, space where one of those rational curves um, uh, degenerates uh, to a point and is contracted. And so here's our M, here's our M0, um, and then we have our base. So this is um, a dominant rational map. Uh, and then this whole thing is our original Lagrangian fibration. So we're going to study the singular fibers of Lagrangian fibrations by uh, factoring the Lagrangian fibration into maps of these types. Technically, this isn't quite sufficient for everything that we need. Um, so uh, we're going to have something slightly more general, um, where before we do this structure of a um, uh, contraction, um, we do a, a k-equivalent birational transformation. Um, so um, as an example, going back to this example, um, we may have an M prime, um, which is birational to the surface and is abstractly the same surface, um, but not under this birational transformation, where um, this curve, um, where we have by degree. Ah, okay. Um, how's how's green? Well, so where we have this curve that wraps one of the um, minus two curves a single extra time. So its degree is n plus one here, and the n there um, gets sent um, under this birational transformation uh, to just a single minus one curve, minus two curve. So such a birational transformation exists. Um, and um, then we know that after we accomplish this transformation, that minus two curve is contractible. Um, so not only can we study, you know, irreducible components of um, uh, Lagrangian fibrations, we can study these sort of weird things where we uh, wrap um, our singular fiber a bunch of times, um, and uh, these are still somehow contractible on intermediate symplectic singularities according to this deformation, definition, where first we do a birational transformation and then we do uh, what we had on the previous screen. Yeah, is there a uh, right, so this is still a p. So it's a it's a chain of p ones. We if we think of it uh, not as an embedded curve, but as a curve that's a that's mapped to the singular fiber. Uh, it's a chain of p ones. Um, but a chain of p ones uh, deforms to a single p one, where we sort of degenerate the p one into a sequence. Um, and that p one is um, exactly this one that wraps a bunch of times. <laughs> Uh, so there, yeah, that's right. So we were, uh, we're deforming a complex structure and we're deforming back and under that deformation, uh, this curve gets switched to one that, uh, wraps the singular fiber a bunch of times. Um, we can't get one where we have, uh, by degree N, N though. So there's no way for that P1 to, by varying the complex structure, um, uh, get to where it, uh, just, you know, wraps a smooth elliptic curve, um, which is the interesting part of the story is uh, those smooth elliptic curves. Um, so an important remark is that um, by results of Markman, um, these uh, 
types of intermediate symplectic singularities exist in tremendous abundance. Um, whenever our um, Lagrangian fibration is part of uh, proper Lagrangian fibration in the sense that M itself is proper, not just the, the fibers of the map. Um, so in general, um, if we have a Lagrangian fibration where our discriminant locus maybe has several irreducible components, um, and over one of the irreducible components of the discriminant locus, as long as um, its inverse image uh, breaks up into more than one irreducible component. Then uh, each of these divisors are contractible um, by an intermediate symplectic singularity. So each of these are contractible. Right, that's right. So this is uh, so this is the simplest example in dimension two. But yeah, then I'm going to apply it to uh, yeah higher dimensional varieties uh, where this structure still holds. So uh, yeah. Uh, um, in those cases, uh, maybe fairly clear. Uh, so this is just a generalization of this particular class. Uh, okay, yeah, I think I think it'll become extremely relevant very soon, uh, where we'll see other examples of Lagrangian formations, not this particular surface, uh, but things which are more like, you know, some proper base B uh, in some M, um, where we have, you know, other divisors that are contractible. That's right. Right. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's the the main example that you should think of is that the Hilbert scheme of points on these surfaces or other elliptic surfaces, um, and their corresponding maps to the base. But there are there are other interesting examples as well. Oh, oh, yeah. or basically this uh the degenerate torus. Yeah, but I thought this I mean I, what I would imagine this torus to be about is some degenerate torus. The torus is breaks up you want to be after studying the magic product of that, no? Um maybe we'll see if the if the picture that I ended up getting to is similar to what you're thinking of. Um but uh, it's so it's somewhat related to this, but those are always sort of in the the fibers, and then we'll. Um, but the the base is always going to be so. There's in in this proper case, uh, there's a result that says if the base is smooth, then it's PN, and then you can even take assumptions off of smooth, um, and uh, still get that it's PN. But basically, the the base of the fibration in the case that the the total holomorphic symplectic variety is proper um, is conjectured to and almost proven to always be PN. Um, and we're going to be interested in sort of uh, subsets of PN like AN and non-proper holomorphic Lagrangian fibrations. Uh, but in the cases that they admit these proper completions, uh, we get this result um, that uh, you know says that we can very frequently contract uh, divisors and understand irreducible components of um, singular fibers by uh, these contraction maps. So the right, so uh, people have studied symplectic singularities and uh, there's a whole bunch of really interesting research on symplectic singularities. And we want to use that research to understand uh, other cases. Um, so in particular, these cases. Uh, so we wanna understand the fact that uh, if you have a minus two curve, its normal bundle in here is it's uh, isomorphic to its cotangent bundle because it's um, uh, symplectic. And uh, then, you know, there's, you know, countless numbers of papers studying the geometric representation theory, the cotangent bundle of P1. Uh, we want to use that understanding to understand these more general cases. 
Um, right, so this is sort of the, the main example uh, that Andre was talking about, um, which is uh, where we have, um, you know, the Hilbert scheme of points on uh, one of these elliptic surfaces. Um, and because we want to do these intermediate symplectic singularities where we do a birational transformation before we do the contraction, we need to study something slightly more general, uh, which is actually not just mo uh, moduli spaces of, for example, torsion free sheaves, which are analogs of um, the Hilbert scheme of points, uh, but we want to study moduli spaces of objects in the derived category of those surfaces, um, subject to enough conditions that they admit these uh, Lagrangian vibrations and are also birational to um, the Hilbert scheme of points. So the, the main example that we're going to talk about is exactly this case um, of where we take elliptic surfaces that maybe aren't this one, uh, but are more general things and um, understand um, their Hilbert scheme of points in the birational models of those. Um, okay, so their first tie into. Uh, Sure. So you're talking about a fiber ring. Is it important that a P1 is really P1? Can I think of P1 as a C? Yeah. Right. So the fiber over infinity uh, is. It's actually, I would call it actually the origin of C. Are you going to have an equivariant action on the P1? There will, right. Yeah. There's going to be an equivariant action on the P1. Um, and the, the fiber over infinity is just uh, uh, like boundary conditions. So it's um, just uh, uh, making it so that we can use the study of um, moduli spaces of sheaves on proper surfaces um, and things associated to proper surfaces. We need to sort of study boundary data infinity, but we're really, really interested in just the um, non-compact part, which is the restriction of the Lagrangian vibration over C. Um, so we're using the fact that um, certain Lagrangian vibrations over C extend to proper surfaces um, with Lagrangian vibrations over P1 um, in order to you know, prove things about uh, Hilbert scheme of points on those non-compact elliptic surfaces um, and that uh, sort of you know, uh, need some sort of information about uh, the um, uh, boundary data infinity in order to okay. define the modular spaces. So basically, we're keeping track. I mean, this is this is similar from uh, the case of um, uh, the ADHM construction of uh, instanton moduli spaces. For example, we don't study instantons on A two; we study them on P two together with framing data at the divisor at infinity. Um, and this is just the analog of that statement that we're replacing A two with the cotangent bundle of an elliptic curve or another uh, elliptic surface over A one, um, and uh, then the divisor at infinity is um, the analog of the divisor at infinity in P2. Right, so our, our first tie-in with uh, geometric representation theory goes back to uh, Kodaira, who classified all of the possible singular fibers of complex elliptic surfaces. Um, so they follow a, an ADE classification, um, Subject, it's not exactly a one to one map with ADA Dinkin diagrams. It's a uh, yeah, several to one map. So, for a particular Dinkin diagram, it's possible that there are um, several fiber structures uh, for low type A um, with the same Dinkin diagram corresponding to its dual graph of curves. Um, but other than that, you know, you have an ADA classification that's um, exactly the same as uh, the classification of uh, singular fibers. So in this particular case, that the examples that I studied before um, is the case of an uh, I uh, two fiber. We have two P ones um, that meet according to the Dinkin diagram of type um, affine A two. Um, sorry, affine A one. So we have A one, and then we have the affine uh, node. Um, and um, yeah, all of the other cases, if you take the, uh, the rational curves um, that are components of the singular fibers, and then you take your dual graph, it's an affine type ADE Dinkin diagram. Um, and they have also these other names labeled by Roman numerals um, that uh, you, know, you can see on the table. Um, 
And then the, the most interesting things happen um, when we restrict um, to uh, this case that Mina was describing, which is where we have uh, an action of a uh, reductive group um, on the corresponding surface so that the uh, elliptic vibration is equivariant with respect to that group action. Um, Um, and in fact, this highly, so I, when I've given the talk online, I, I wrote in this section, but I didn't modify it, uh, for the blackboard format. Um, but the argument basically goes like this. Uh, if we want it to be C star equivariant, um, then this implies, uh, that the J invariant is constant. Um, so the J invariant is a complete classification of um, uh, complex structures on uh, two-dimensional tori. Um, and if it's equivariant with respect to C star, then you know the fiber at one and the fiber at Q um, are going to be isomorphic to each other, which means they're going to have the same J invariant. Um, and uh, only certain singular fibers um, can occur where the J invariant uh, doesn't tend to infinity. Um, so for example, all of the higher type A um, and higher type D singular fibers um, require there to be a pole um, in the J invariant. Um, and what we're left with are um, two infinite families and three other examples of um, elliptic surfaces um, corresponding to uh, our two infinite families are just the uh, trivial elliptic vibration. Um, so we have our fiber over zero and our fiber at infinity. Um, these are just uh, I zero fibers. Um, for this, the J invariant can be anything. Um, then we have uh, the cases where both fibers are type I zero star corresponding to um, at affine D Ford Dinkin diagram. And then the other cases all come from uh, the existence of elliptic curves uh, with automorphisms that aren't just the Z mod 2 Z automorphism. Um, so they correspond to uh, when we have a cuspidal curve at one end um, and an affine E8 fiber at the other end. Um, so this corresponds to type, oh gosh, I think this is two and two star. Um, and then uh, likewise, we have a configuration of two smooth rational curves um, meeting at a point uh, and E7 affine at the other side, which is three and three star. And then finally, we have uh, three rational curves meeting at a point on an E6 fiber on the other side, corresponding to type four and type four star. Uh, I'm gonna put question marks on the ordering of these two, three, and fours, uh, but I guess we can check on the previous table to see how I did. Um, no, I think I got it backwards. No, that's right, okay, I did well. Um, great. So mostly we're going to study these cases because we want to, um, have algebras that admit, uh, deformations and the, uh, equivariant parameter associated with this C star is going to be the, uh, parameter that deforms our algebra, um, which restricts from the very general setting to moduli spaces of, uh, sheaves over elliptic surfaces to the moduli space of sheaves over, uh, these five elliptic surfaces. Um, and an important comment is that um, in the cases corresponding to uh, D4 and type E, um, the invariant Hilbert scheme, so one particular choice of chamber, um, has been uh, understood to be related to uh, parabolic Higgs bundles um, on uh, those orbifold uh, P1 curves. So in these cases, we have a description of, our, of um, 
uh, one of our fibers as uh, an elliptic orbifold because they come from the fact that we have elliptic curves with automorphisms. And if you take the weighted projective line uh, corresponding to uh, those orbifold uh, P1s, uh, then the, there's the relation between moduli spaces of parabolic Higgs bundles on those and one particular choice of chamber uh, for the moduli spaces that we're going to discuss. So if you were to study cool branches with polydactyls in a circle, would Right, so Coulomb branches of uh, like rank one superconformal field theories uh, gives you, uh, I think, exactly this list. Um, and then, yeah, so so there's if you consider um, the theory of a, a single D three brain probing an F theory singularity with a circle, uh, then you get um, you know either no singular fibers or the type D four and type E cases. Um, and then, uh, you know, the lowest rank, um, uh, the Argyris Douglas theories uh, in rank one that are super conformal correspond to the uh, sort of A types um, that uh, sort of you only get super conformal theories at low energies and they don't quite have the same F theory description. Um, so, there, yeah, there's also, um, especially in the type D4 um, and type E cases. Uh, the um, corresponding Coulomb branches are the uh, Coulomb branches of a D3 written probing an F3 singularity on exactly the like orbifold elliptic curve. Um, there are also stories in higher rank. So there are in higher rank, uh, there's some uh, in terms of for higher rank, it's not clear how actually to get the Hilbert scheme of points as Coulomb branches, but to get the symmetric product. Um, this is well understood. Um, so there's a class S description in types D4 and type E. Um, and people have various ideas about how to smooth the singularities you get on the symmetric product of these elliptic surfaces. Um, but basically you expect there to be a, a, a class S description in types D and E um, and uh, sort of a class S with irregular punctures in the other cases in higher ranks. Um, and then uh, the two infinite families uh, both have limits to where the J invariant tends to infinity, where there's actually a gauge theory description of the corresponding 40 theories. Um, so uh, the I zero case is just going to be uh, 40 n equals four theory. And then the D four um, uh, has a gauge theory description with uh, some matter, matter that I can't name off the top of my head. If there is no generalization of, uh, of the event I mean, of the, of the explicit DFM construction uh, to construct these Coulomb branches, not that I know of. Um, yeah, maybe somebody else knows this better. Uh, but actually, constructing these Hilbert schemes as BFN Coulomb branches, I don't know. I mean, the the explicit description gives you Lagrangian fibrations that aren't compact. So maybe in some complex structure or something. But yeah, I have no idea. Um, yeah, basic answer is I have no idea. Um, ah, so you think no, that yeah, if you take those BFN Coulomb branches yeah, in, in uh, and, section, but yeah, we didn't do it for all. You, all you would get types. exactly these spaces. Cool. Um, okay, so maybe I don't have time to go over this, uh, but. Uh, these particular elliptic surfaces have, uh, you know, important relations to other parts of math. Um, so, for example, it's known that they um, exhaust the classification of uh, Euclidean hyperkähler manifolds with uh, fast decay and infinity based on recent, recent work of like a ton of people. Um, and other examples is if you take, uh, you know, the kähler ritchie flow on a K3 surface, there are sort of bubbles that occur. Um, and uh, some of these choices occur as those bubbles. Um, and other choices, which um, are uh, also extremely interesting, but don't admit the equivariant structure, are where we take the same surfaces, but instead of framing it infinity, we frame it a smooth fiber. Um, and, uh, you know, somehow this is kind of the next step is to understand those cases, uh, which are known to have, you know, important relations to the enumerative geometry of K3 surfaces on account of the fact that uh, there's an algebraic description of this bubbling process where we degenerate a K3 surface into uh, 
two of those examples. Um, and I'm not going to comment on the last slide on the last slide. Um, okay, so uh, here is where we're going to. Uh, oh, sorry, it's AL, e, uh, D, I mean, it's, you're getting something close to natural products, right? And you're going to run out of letters. Uh, right. So A L E F G H. Uh, yeah. So do you think that, 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 that something special happens and at some fixed end you can't get a smooth space anymore? So this is just the surfaces themselves, not symmetric products. So these are all just four dimensions. Um, and then I'm studying the, the example of Hilbert schemes of points on these surfaces is the same as Hilbert scheme of points on A L G gravitational instant points. Don't think there's some... Um, and, uh, okay. Uh, as a How do you get anything then beyond ALH? So ALH uh, comes from we take the same surface and we uh, get rid of a smooth fiber. So this is uh, becomes asymptotically equivalent uh, in uh, to to um, uh, R times uh, S one cubed times a three torus. Um, whereas if we remove the divisor at infinity, we get something which is asymptotically equivalent to um, you know, a two torus times uh, R2. Um, but basically, I have nothing interesting to say geometric representation theoretically with respect to uh, ALH. Um, but uh, yeah, so we're sort of stuck at the uh, ALG level. Um, but you know, hopefully there's an analogous story for the others. Um, right, so uh, the, now we're gonna go back to these pictures where we want to understand uh, moduli spaces of sheaves on these surfaces and the structure of singular fibers um, using uh, tools from birational geometry. Um, Right. So, so if instead of uh, right, so that I mean, the most interesting things are going to be when instead of uh, you know that you take a finite auto automorphism of uh, an elliptic curve and you have that act on the cotangent bundle of the elliptic curve. This is sort of the ALG cases are you know resolutions of the singularities that you get there. Um, so. Uh, right, so there, I mean, there are analogs of these um, for, I don't know for the ALH cases, um, but for, you know, the analog for K3 surfaces would be like you take an element of the Mathieu 24 group and uh, act on the threefold, which is the total space of the canonical line bundle of that K3 surface. Um, but uh, I don't know how, somehow I'm, I'm using, uh, Maybe if you had a, a finite group and did things over like characteristic P or something, but I don't know if a finite group acts on these ALH spaces preserving their asymptotic structure. So yeah, I don't know. Maybe if you had. Uh, a large cyclic group uh, acting on. Ah, okay, we could talk about it. Um, right, so, uh, and there's a, a whole bunch of work studying the uh, birational geometry of moduli spaces of sheaves on elliptic surfaces. Um, so for K3 surfaces, for uh, smooth moduli spaces, it's um, uh, essentially completely understood. Um, for more general elliptic surfaces, uh, the results that I'm going to describe uh, about just uh, their birational chambers are um, in this paper of Yoshioka. Um, and everything we need from birational geometry, if we're okay working not equivariantly and we're working in the analytic category, uh, entirely follows from these papers of Byer McCree. Um, so if we don't care about this uh, H-bar parameter, we can just... Um, uh, embed one of these singular fibers um, and a neighborhood around it into a K3 surface. 
um, and uh, use the fact that the Hilbert scheme of points on that surface um, uh, analytically embeds as an open set into the Hilbert scheme of points on a K3 surface. Um, and then complex deformations of those moduli spaces give um, deformations of uh, th their analytic open sets. Um, and uh, you can get a whole bunch of results there. The issue is that um, you, know, you can't do this equivariantly uh, because you don't know how those sort of deformations scale with the parameter. In particular, there's no C star that acts on any compact hypercalar manifold. Um, and uh, so we completely lose um, C star H bar if we want to work in the analytic category, um, among other things. Um, so um, the, you know, a key result is that uh, in some, some of this is work in progress is that in the algebraic category, equivariantly, uh, we can study um, moduli spaces of uh, framed stable complexes, or in other words, uh, uh, birational models, uh, so, so subject to a condition so that they're birational models of the Hilbert scheme of points. Um, we can study their uh, birational uh, geometry and equivariant deformation theory uh, using techniques analogous to uh, the work of uh, Byron McCree. Um, so uh, we have a wall and chamber structure on uh, the class of relative Cartier divisors of these moduli spaces over AN, uh, where chambers in, are in one to one correspondence with um, uh, K trivial, so also in this case, holomorphic symplectic projective birational models um, of that surface. Um, so uh, in examples analogous to the two-dimensional case, um, this says that um, all of our birational models um, essentially correspond to things that look like this, uh, these maps from M prime uh, to M, where one of our P1s gets replaced with um, a curve of degree um, uh, n plus one and n on um, either side. Um, so the other sort of important part is that if we take any two of these birational uh, models, um, then they are uh, equivariantly deformation equivalent. Um, meaning that if we have one of these m's um, and an m prime, there exist uh, one dimensional families um, of uh, deformations of uh, holomorphic symplectic varieties um, so that um, over uh, B and B prime um, and um, outside of uh, zero, these deform to, I don't know, curly M modulo M. And here we have uh, curly M prime uh, without M prime. Um, and this is an isomorphism uh, outside of the fiber at zero. And uh, C star H bar um, scales uh, the base of the vibration with a uh, contraction to zero. Um, so let's see. Uh, the proof of this uh, is kind of complicated, uh, but there's a ton of theory about results that essentially lets us um, uh, construct the analogous moduli spaces in these cases. Um, and uh, the only part that's really sort of hard. Uh, so these are, so in examples, um, these correspond to uh, birational uh, hypercalar um, manifolds that also admit the Grangian vibrations over the same base, and they're also projective over the base. Um, so basically just flops of your um, holomorphic symplectic variety um, that uh, also admit uh, Lagrangian vibrations. Um, right, so we'll... Um, and they, they end up being, so they're all other moduli spaces of uh, framed stable complexes. So if you take the Hilbert scheme of points on one of these surfaces, um, and then you want a birational hypercalar variety that admits a Lagrangian vibration over the same base, 
um, then uh, all of the birational models are other choices of moduli spaces of now no longer uh, frame torsion free sheaves, but they're uh, objects in the derived category that at infinity are locally free sheaves together with a choice of framing. Um, and this claim is entirely analogous to the story of Byram Nakree, which is uh, why um, in the analytic category, uh, you can just take all of these as consequences of um, uh, that story. Um, right, so the, the hard part of this proof um, is uh, modification of ideas to, is, you know, this word, which says that um, uh, the birational models are uh, projective, um, or rather their deformations are. Um, but luckily there are in these particular cases, so when we're restricting the moduli spaces of sheaves on uh, these surfaces, uh, the work of, you know, Lieblick, Tonvaki, uh, Eric Raines, and then this six author paper about stability conditions in families uh, is able to construct these moduli spaces as, um, you know, algebraic spaces. And then it is difficult to actually show that they're um, projective varieties. Um, but in these particular cases, there's a, a technique which is sufficient to actually uh, give uh, line bundles on them and describe them as um, actual projective varieties, um, which uh, the idea is basically due to Julian Lee um, with its uh, sort of modifications um, in, very, in the sort of framed case and in this sort of uh, moduli of objects in the derived category setting and the interpretation of uh, you know, moduli spaces in this form uh, due to uh, Thomas Piaka. Um, so, okay, so I'm going to say a brief word about uh, the deformations. Um, and so some of the deformations are the most interesting ones um, that we don't have access to in the analytic category. Um, are those that come from uh, non-commuter deformations of our surfaces. Um, so in the T star E case, um, and then uh, a similar argument works um, in the other cases, and then uh, for the D4 and type E cases, um, and then the type A cases is uh, a work in progress, but I basically know how it works. Uh, we get deformations of the moduli spaces by deforming the surface. Um, and how do we deform the surface? Um, is well, we have commutative deformations, then we have uh, non-commutative deformations. Um, and uh, these come from uh, the fact that we can deform um, cotangent bundles um, in a number of ways. So the uh, these cases are all cotangent bundles of um, uh, elliptic orbifolds or the resolutions. Um, and in the simplest case, which is just T star E, uh, we want surfaces which are deformations of the cotangent bundles of an elliptic curve. And what we're going to do is we're going to take um, the, the universal uh, deformation of the cotangent fibers. Um, so these are classified by elements of the first Hothschild homology group of the derived category of E. Um, so X1 in the uh, derived category of the product of the surface itself of the diagonal by the cotangent uh, bundle on the diagonal, um, which is the same as the diagonal, just with a different equivariant structure. Um, and uh, then work of Vanderberg uh, produces a uh, DG category, which is a, a non-commutative P1 bundle over that curve. Uh, which was in, interpreted by Orlov in these cases as uh, a gluing of DG categories. Um, and so these non-commutative P1 bundles over the elliptic curve admit uh, semi-orthogonal decompositions where the factors are just um, two copies of the derived category of the elliptic curve. Technically, it doesn't work if you just use derived categories and you have to use DG categories and glue uh, DG extensions of those categories. Um, but um, we, uh, in the language of Orlov, we glue these two subcategories along uh, the bimodule, which is defined by uh, this extension. Um, and uh, then we're able to construct deformed moduli spaces. Um, and they uh, turn out to be, uh, have a fairly simple description in terms of uh, moduli spaces of um, 
distinguished triangles um, in at the level of closed points uh, of distinguished triangles in the derived category of the corresponding curve, um, where we have one object in the derived category maps to the second tensor R bi module, and then uh, we say that the cone is exactly our framing sheaf, and we fix an isomorphism of the cone with F. Um, at the level of closed points and not of deformations, this uh, these moduli spaces um, have uh, essentially uh, been uh, entirely understood by work of Bensby and Nevins. Um, and uh, after that, there's all of this abstract theory uh, about construction of these moduli spaces and families that allows us to uh, not just study closed points, but also say that the families deform. Um, so and, and sort of interesting aside um, is that um, on these moduli spaces, there's a, a Fourier transform um, that exchanges uh, commutative and non-commutative deformations. Um, and uh, that's uh, stuff from, uh, so in some sense of this, that it's like a drive, a DG category that isn't the DG category of coherent sheaves on a commutative scheme. Um, but for the one particular choice of bimodule extension here, uh, is the bimodule extension that deforms, uh, symmetric powers on the cotangent bundle to, uh, uh, the bundle of differential operators. So if you replace E with a one, uh, one direction of deformations here. Um, is the deformations from um, uh, polynomials in two variables uh, to the first while algebra. I mean, how could there even no categories in the first place? Um, the categories themselves, um, the... Uh, <laughs> I mean, that doesn't make sense. category is. We're almost entirely only interested in this in order to understand the fibers over zero. Uh, so we use the deformations um, and uh, the fact that a generic deformation of a holomorphic symplectic variety has no curves in it in order to understand the fibers over zero. So we're, uh, we're basically not interested in, uh, you know, other fibers. Uh, we're interested in the fact that the central fiber has these deformations uh, with nice enough properties to control the central fiber. Um, and uh, so in particular, we get um, the fact that two different birational models are uh, equivariantly deformation equivalent by saying that as we uh, take two uh, generic deformations, uh, we know that the deformations are birational, and since they're generic, the birational transformations can't contract any curves, uh, which implies that they're actually isomorphic to each other outside of the central fiber. Um, and that produces the uh, fact that uh, these two spaces are equivariantly um, uh, deformation equivalent to each other. Um, so that's sort of the main output of uh, this theory um, is the uh, algebraic deformation equivalent statement. But again, we only care about the central fiber where these are, uh, in the end, just commutative um, uh, varieties, and we and entirely live in the world of, uh, you know, commutative algebraic geometry. Right. So, so this element of H, H, H upper one is an extension of two line bundles over the diagonal um, on E cross E. So on E cross E, um, uh, that extension gives us um, psi, uh, which is a rank two bundle over the diagonal. Um, and then we take the non-commutative projectivization of this uh, which is a projectivization of a rank two bundle. Um, and then it's going to contain. What did you back up? Uh, so uh, I'm going to refer you to uh, Vandenberg uh, for one definition, and the other definition I'm going to write here, um, which is a uh, DG category that emits a semi orthogonal decomposition with uh, two that? factors. Uh, so, um, 
A2 tensor that by module A2 is an element of the derived category. Uh, we take the tensor of a by module uh, with the module on one side and we get a module for the other. Um, right, so I'm, I'm identifying the, ex the extension class with the resulting uh, by module that we get corresponding to the extension. And it gives us uh, a, a rank two bundle over the diagonal, which is a bimodule on this side and on that side. Right. Exactly. Um, okay. So now we get to uh, the you know interesting structures that arise um, in uh, this list of examples. Um, so for the case of uh, just the simplest case of a, a trivial uh, Lagrangian fibration, um, which is just uh, the cotangent bundle of the elliptic curve. Um, the theory produces for us a, um, The theory produces for us a wall and chamber structure um, on uh, the space of relative Cartier divisors um, over the base. Um, so here we have a, a two dimensional space of N1 of T sorry to the N um, over a N. Um, so this is spanned by, uh, so uh, relative divisors. So uh, I'll give you a basis of it. Um, so there are divisors on this um, smooth surface, which corresponds to, um, you know, complex co-dimension one uh, sub varieties. Um, and um, we also know the cohomology of this um, is given in terms of uh, Nakajima operators. Um, so, uh, right, maybe the better way to describe it is to describe it as the, the dual of curves. Uh, so the dual to uh, divisors in co-dimension one are uh, you know, numerical classes of dimension one, which correspond to curves. Um, and the dual of this are algebraic curves, and we have um, sort of CE, uh, which is a curve in the Hilbert scheme corresponding to you keep n minus one points fixed, and you have one point wrap the elliptic curve. Um, and then we have uh, C2, uh, which corresponds to we have, we keep n minus two points fixed, um, and then we move um, a double point halfway around. Uh, gives us another curve uh, in the Hilbert scheme. Um, and um, we know these two spaces are dual. We know that this is two dimensional by work of Nakajima. Um, and uh, these pair with the divisors uh, that we know generate this by work of Nakajima. And it says that this is a, a, a two dimensional space, which is exactly the dual of this. Um, and then it has a well and chamber structure. Um, so, yeah, you keep n minus two points fixed, and then you keep the, the locus of the other two points fixed at the same point. So we have a, a double point. Uh, a P1. Yeah, you get a P1. Uh, that these two curves are integral generators for uh, the, cla the numerical classes of curves um, of our moduli space um, over the base. And it's dual. Um, so all of these curves are contracted by uh, the, the map to the base. So the base doesn't remember the scheme structure at all. And if you trace out an elliptic curve, that curve gets contracted. And this gives us a, a basis for uh, 
the numerical classes of curves that are contracted and it's dual um, is exactly this. And uh, it's dual is the um, uh, locus of um, uh, like ample, relatively ample line bundles on these moduli spaces. Um, so there's a chamber in this relative uh, uh, Cartier divisor group um, corresponding to uh, the Neff cone of uh, the uh, corresponding Hilbert scheme. Um, and then our other chambers correspond to uh, the Neff cones of other birational models. Um, so the examples of these, um, okay, I assumed N is uh, greater than one. Uh, for N is equal to one, we don't get this curve. Uh, we just get that curve. Um, and uh, but the analogous story still holds in most cases. That's right. Yeah, symmetric. The n symmetric power of a one, which is uh, a n. Right, and so we're going to draw the um, uh, Neff cones according to a wall and chamber structure, and then the the Mori cone of curves as uh, like a lattice. Um, so dual to this wall and chamber structure is uh, a lattice with particular choices of uh, points in the lattice that correspond to exceptional curves. Um, so we have an infinite number of exceptional curves uh, in the you know, I2 fiber case. Those infinite number of exceptional curves correspond to uh, just the ones that I drew um, uh, that are labeled in green and the ones where you have N on one side and uh, N plus one on the other. Um, so there's another perspective on this, which is um, related to the story of uh, you know, bubbling of the Kähler-Ritchie flow, um, which is uh, you know how these moduli spaces relate to um, uh, moduli spaces of sheaves on K3 surfaces, and we can essentially think of them um, as birational transformations um, around singular fibers in moduli spaces and K3 surfaces. Um, in those cases, you uh, have a um, your positive cone, um, your uh, n, your h two of your surface. Um, the algebraic part of this has a uh, Lorentzian inner pairing on it, um, and uh, this also induces a Lorentzian pairing on. Um, the uh, H2 of your corresponding moduli spaces. And you get an analogous wall and chamber structure where chambers correspond to Neff cones of birational models. Um, and if we look near uh, points on the boundary of the positive cone, which correspond to proper Lagrangian vibrations on uh, Hilbert schema points on a, a K3 surface, um, then uh, the structure of the Neff cone of these non-compact surfaces is what shows up um, as, as a, a limit as we approach uh, the boundary of the positive cone in the proper case. Um, so it has some sort of uh, limit description where the volume of uh, the fiber on a proper vibration goes to zero compared to the volume of the base and everything else. Um, so let's see some other examples beyond the T star E case. Um, so this corresponds to the Hilbert scheme of points on uh, these surfaces um, with an I2 fiber, or uh, maybe better is we're gonna think of it as a singular fiber of type three. Um, and uh, there's an analogous wall and chamber structure, uh, which um, if we take the analog of uh, splice, um, That's right. So they move, they meet tangent to each other. So they still have uh, self intersection two. And so we still have an affine type one because they meet, uh, they're both smooth, but they meet uh, um, at a. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's right here, right? So it's two, it's two P1s. Uh, the. Uh, so.
let's see. So, right, we want to see a two dimensional torus that degenerates to uh, this union. Um, yeah, maybe you can think of it as kind of a limit of the I2 case where uh, these corresponding nodes uh, meet each other. Um, yeah, so that's that really is kind of what it is, is you take exactly the, uh, you know, uh, this torus, um, and then, you know, you just have these two points um, come together. Um, right, and so it has uh, a wall and chamber structure. If you take a vertical slice, uh, we get uh, a wall and chamber structure uh, just corresponding to, um, you know, the dual of the integers. Um, and that corresponds exactly to, uh, you know, walls dual to these curves. Um, the Hilbert scheme of points on the surface has uh, one extra dimension of um, uh, N1. Um, and the uh, vertical walls, not the ones perpendicular to vertical walls, but the vertical walls themselves, are exactly the same as the uh, vertical walls in the previous picture. Right, of 40 n equals four un, I think, yeah. And, uh, and what's the quiver of this side? Uh, right, so this is, uh, right, so this particular case uh, is like an, or should be a higher rank version of uh, our Jairus Douglas theories. Uh -huh. Okay, so you have usually Right, so the, the uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so it'll have description as like, uh, you know, Higgs, uh, like meromorphic Higgs bundles with irregular singularities at some of the points. Um, um, right. And so we have this wall and chamber structure on the Hilbert scheme. Um, and then it has sort of, it gets more complicated as the number of points increase. Um, so unfortunately, the, uh, uh, okay. you're, you, so, so to me, it's surprising fact that, that you can get such singularities for a more reasoning and very, I would have thought, no, I should say, yeah. Right. I mean, it ultimately comes from the fact that, uh, you know, you get an, uh, an action. I mean, they're, they're, uh, yeah, they're, um, uh, the surface admits an equivariant structure, and then that induces an equivariant structure on the Hilbert scheme of points. Um, um, right. And uh, right. So then we get a wall and chamber structure on uh, the corresponding moduli spaces that uh, grows in complexity. Um, an important feature of the story is that we can understand the the local um, analytic behavior and even the Atal local behavior um, of uh, singularities corresponding to degenerating metrics um, using work of Arbarello Saka and of Ben Davis. Um, so how does this work? If we take um, you know, one of these uh, configuration of walls in a degenerating metric corresponding to uh, the uh, intersection of all of those walls. So here we have, uh, how many points is this? This is four points, which means um, that there's one, two, three here, and uh, one, two, three here. Uh, as, and then, so if this is our Neff cone, uh, as we approach the boundary of the Neff cone, uh, we get a singular uh, moduli space M0, um, and our uh, smooth moduli space of sheaves degenerates to um, a uh, singular symplectic variety. So this is a singular symplectic variety. Um, which in this particular case uh, corresponds to 
uh, the symmetric products of n points on uh, the singular surface that I just erased. So the same, so uh, where we have um, our uh, P1 uh, degenerates to a point, um, we take the symmetric product of these. Um, so this is uh, the... Uh, near infinity, you well, we're forgetting infinity entirely. Uh, of this, so we degenerate one of these minus two curves, we contract it to a point, and we don't do anything at infinity, so we get a type affine E7 singular fiber at infinity. Um, and the singular symplectic variety associated to this um, boundary of the Neff cone corresponds to the symmetric product um, of the endpoints on that singular elliptic surface. Um, and then all of the other ones uh, have descriptions of singularities of Nakajima quiver varieties. Um, in this case, all of type um, affine, uh, at worst, um, affine A1 uh, with various choices of framing um, and uh, dimension vectors uh, or products of those um, are uh, all of these other choices of uh, singular symplectic varieties corresponding to intermediate symplectic singularities. Sir, are they looking for about giving x one slice the maximum? Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm taking a, a co-dimension-one slice uh, that's over the uh, plane where we're perpendicular to the elliptic curve. So uh, we only get Neff cones in the half space where our uh, divisor pairs positively with CE. And then I'm taking a slice, say, at level one there. And the more singular one, they function, how is the... Right, yeah, the most singular ones are going to be where you have a bunch of walls uh, intersecting. Yeah, it ends up being periodic, actually. So there's actually a while group. So all of the red walls correspond to divisorial contractions, where if you can still kind of see the shadow here, we have those uh, divisors contracting. Um, and then there's a while group, which is a reflection along um, the uh, classes of those divisors in N1. Um, and uh, the uh, structure is symmetric under that uh, while group, um, which in the you know, conical case is known as the Namakawa while group, and in the compact case is known as you know, the Markman while group. Um, so you know, maybe the, I think uh, Nevins and Stafford call it the symplectic Galois group, but there's a, there's a while group that uh, um, exchanges uh, reflections at the red walls which is why I've distinguished them, right? Okay, and then it gets more complicated as you add uh, more and more points. Um, okay, now we're in the, the next part of the talk, which is about uh, quantum groups and Yangians that you can associate to uh, these singularities. Um, so, um, let's see, how am I doing on time? I still have some amount of time. Um, so we're gonna start with the cohomology theory, uh, which um, really, we're just going to be uh, let the algebraic K0 or uh, Boromore homology that we're going to perhaps take uh, equivariantly with respect to the C star H bar. Um, so, associated to each of these singularities, um, we get um, actions of uh, certain algebras um, on the cohomologies of our moduli spaces. Um, so, our walls have uh, divisions into, uh, you know, real or imaginary, um, corresponding uh, to, um, you know, things that look like the duals to uh, C two, um, corresponding to, um, you know, an imaginary root um, associated to this Dinkin diagram, um, which is. Uh, for example, this wall is imaginary. Uh, and then we have uh, real walls, um, which are uh, dual to, um, you know, curves. Uh, well, there's a boville bogomolov form um, on the space of curves. And when they're minus two curves, their complements are uh, 
or their negative curves, then their complements correspond to real root walls. Um, and um, in that picture, um, all of the uh, walls that aren't strictly vertical uh, correspond to real walls. So in this picture, for example, all of our vertical walls are imaginary um, and uh, everything else is real. Um, we get actions on cohomology associated to um, all of the... No, it's not minus two, it's some other, it's just, but whenever it's negative, it corresponds to a real wall. Uh, but it's still, the, the, uh, the corresponding quiver that you get is still just like a, a the, the Carton matrix story is a, just a, a two at that node. Um, there isn't an, a correspondence between the Bogomolov form and the um, uh, Carton pairing. So, for example, even if you take, so the Bovil Bogomolov form on like the cotangent bundle to like P3, I think the norm of that curve is like minus five thirds or I don't know the exact number, but it's not, it's not minus two. Um, those, yeah, those numbers, as far as I know, don't really have uh, representation theoretic significance like in the Carton matrix. Yeah, so there's, um, I think maybe now a theorem um, of, uh, which was a conjecture of uh, maybe Hassett and Schinkel or maybe some other names says that uh, whenever you have a um, curve of negative Bovo-Mogomolov norm, then it's contractible on a birational model. And that's the case in, all, in here. Um, so actually even the, uh, even the norm of the, uh, um, C2 is negative also. Um, right, so actually, yeah, the, the bovo gomolov norm is not, uh, has, no, has no relation at all to uh, the uh, type of singularity that you get, but they correspond to curves of negative bovo gomolov norm. Um, and what type corresponds to, uh, if you take the corresponding X quiver, uh, whether you get a Carton matrix of type two or zero. So yeah, that was my mistake. Um, but in all these cases, uh, we only get real and imaginary roots uh, corresponding to Carton matrices where you only have uh, you know, zeros and um, twos. Um, and uh, the corresponding quantum groups and Yangians you get are those associated to um, you know, finite and uh, affine type ADE uh, Dinkin diagrams um, together with uh, you know, GL1 um, hat Bye. Ah, okay. So uh, this is some story about Bridgeland stability conditions. So what, what, how, how do we determine what type of wall it is? Uh, each of these walls corresponds to uh, when uh, the um, we have a, a Bridgeland stability condition, uh, which has a stability function with values on a heart of a T structure and some half space. Um, and uh, the, we have A1 and A2 that have the same phase. Uh, then as we vary our stability conditions so that the phases of objects um, uh, overlap, um, then it's possible for their direct sums to be stable, which induces singularities on the moduli spaces. So these refer to if we have uh, so this is the Neff cone of our moduli space. Um, and then uh, sitting inside of M0, um, let's see, I'll put it here. Uh, we might have um, a sheaf, uh, which is A0 uh, direct sum A1. Associated to the data of these uh, polystable representatives of points in the singular moduli spaces, you can get a quiver. Um, and whether the quiver is of, uh, finite or affine uh, ADE type corresponds to uh, the quantum group uh, that you get at each of the walls. Um, so, right, so where, do you, where does the quiver come from? Uh, is it really comes from the X quiver of a polystable representative in M0? Um, sure. But then, I mean, 
do want to be invisible, then it can really fail to become a problem. Uh, right, so it's uh, the uh, e to the beta plus. The real part is exactly the coordinate. Well, right, so the central charge is the. Yeah, there's a complexification of that space, and it's uh, exactly so it's the central charge is exactly uh, e to the um, omega plus ib uh, paired with uh, the Chern class of your corresponding vector is e of ch. Um, and then uh, omega ranges over uh, the exactly this positive half. And then uh, b uh, ranges over uh, the entire um, n1. Right, yeah, it's so the... Uh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. In general, it's not. There's like a square root of the Todd class and, yeah. and all the answer Right. So the square root of the Todd class in this case sort of gets sent to infinity. So there's this, uh, the, if you take these surfaces, they're. On, no, just on all, uh, uh, coherent sheaves on the compact surface. Um, so yeah, it's on uh, it's on yeah entirely the B model. So it's entirely on coherent okay. sheaves. Um, okay, so how do we sort of get these algebras? And uh, it's um, you know uh, at various levels of um, uh, you know, whether you have subalgebras of larger and larger and more deformed algebras, it's due to, um, you know, an entire list of people that I'll list some of them um, on the next slide. Um, but basically, they come from uh, these correspondence diagrams. So if you have two different moduli spaces um, and uh, that whose churn characters differ by um, M alpha, where um, alpha corresponds to one of, say, these isotropic roots, um, so that M alpha then becomes isomorphic to another copy of your surface itself. Uh, we get a diagram corresponding to, um, you know, pairs of sheaves that uh, um, fit into an exact sequence, and the associated quotient um, is the, the right term of the sequence. And then there's a tautological line bundle living over these. Um, and then we're going to take this story when M alpha literally is the surface itself, where we're modifying uh, a sheaf, a torsion free sheaf on our surface by a point. Um, and then we're going to conjugate everything by a derived auto equivalence of our surface. Uh, a description of the uh, quantum groups that you get at the uh, singular points. In this particular case, just corresponding to. Um, isotropic roots, or in the picture that you saw above, the, the vertical walls. So uh, singular metrics as we degenerate to um, a generic point on one of these vertical walls. Uh, so that um, is related, but I want to describe the algebra that you get by uh, modifications of points. So um, the it'll turn out that the uh, categories, the abelian categories that you get are um, uh, related by the exchange of a uh, vector of a, um, an object that lives in M alpha. And then I want to describe what happens as you sort of modify sheaves by objects of, of M alpha. And in the case of vertical walls, um, we can pick a derived auto equivalence of our surface, which is just a relative Fourier Mackay transform um, that sends um, uh, our class alpha to the class of a point. Um, so uh, at the level of um, you know, just numerical classes, it sends the churn character of um, uh, a class churn character alpha uh, to the structure sheaf of a point. Um, and um, then we know how to um, modify uh, torsion-free sheaves 
um, along points. And then it turns out that each of these two corresponding walls correspond to torsion-free sheaves on that derived dual surface um, or derived duals of torsion-free sheaves on that surface. Um, so in the case of an isotropic wall, On a what? I don't know of it in this language. Um, ah, sure. Um, right. So uh, if this this corresponds to when you have, uh, you know, generically all of your phases of objects are separate, except for there are two objects, uh, simple objects whose phases can overlap. So there's a, this is like a, a two dimensional space of like open string states between brains or something. It, it corresponds to uh, when you generically hit a wall. So um, Right, that's right. Yeah, so in all of these cases, the wall um, uh, corresponds to, okay, so it, uh, is bijective to the uh, Ulenbeck Donaldson Ulenbeck morphism. Um, and so it's the its singularities are as complicated as the Donaldson Ulenbeck morphism contracting Giesecker semi stable sheaves to the Ulenbeck factification. I'm about to write that down. Technically, I only noticed it at a level of uh, bijection of closed points. Um, but uh, right, so here we have our wall W uh, where. Um, the uh, phase of E overlaps with the phase of alpha. Um, under a derived equivalence, um, we have um, that alpha gets sent to uh, the structure sheaf of a point, um, or rather um, a shift of it. Um, and in that, uh, derived duality frame. Here we just have uh, moduli spaces of uh, framed Giesecker stable sheaves. So these are uh, um, H semi stable torsion free sheaves. Um, and on the other side of the wall, we have um, our moduli space uh, corresponding to the derived duals of sheaves E prime, which is isomorphic under the derived duality functor to just moduli spaces of, um, uh, again, uh, Giesecker semi-stable sheaves. Um, and uh, what happens as you cross the wall? Uh, well, you have um, exact sequences corresponding to E injects into its double dual. Um, and then we have um, sheaves supported at some number of points. Uh, maybe that should be minus one. Um, this becomes a destabilizing sequence. Um, and on the other side of the wall, uh, you have the uh, the dual sequence um, uh, is stable. So here we have um, E double dual goes to the derived dual of some E prime, uh, which doesn't lie in the same moduli space depending on the first string character here. And then we have uh, OY of minus one to something. Um, so as the phase of these objects um, overlaps, um, 
uh, we get certain sequences that destabilize that become stable on the other side of the wall. Um, and associated to each of these chambers, we get a diagram corresponding to when we modify uh, a sheaf E and a sheaf F that differ um, uh, except at um, that are the same outside of a point and the relative quotient is isomorphic to that point. And then we apply uh, some Fourier Mackay transform to that entire story and we get this diagram. Right, that's right. So that's right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly right. So that one sort of uh, interesting difference is that um, in the same way that 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 the the moduli spaces of points can have other cohomology classes on them. So what, what, for real roots, you get literally everything is exactly the same, and this is um, uh, you know you actually just get the um, you know the right. corresponding. Right. Image. Right. Exactly. Right, and right, and so that fact that you can go around gives you really interesting things. So, for example, in these particular cases, it extends like uh, you know the Heisenberg algebra or analogous like uh, W infinity algebras to um, you know supersymmetric extensions of those, so like the super W. Um, right, um, and in, it's uh, so what. It would be nice if you had a way of saying that you had this local structure and you were able to piece it together into a global structure and get algebra algebras this way. Um, instead, you you need some way to get a global structure, either by some sophisticated gluing process or already knowing the birational geometry, um, in order to uh, sort of get the global algebra. So. But these are it's just in a different complex structure because basically you've got at least some stuff that it won't just the four measure of four dimensional gauge theory in a circle, like an actual gauge theory, not a not 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 in a, a zero bubble. I want something to do with a rounded theory. Okay, like so that would that would be the, the 40 n equals four un corresponding to the um these cases and then this d4 or uh, should should uh survive the story simplification and have a sense of the theory. Interesting. Um, okay, right, and then the, the diagrams that were on the last slide uh, by work of uh, Nakajima, Bernowski, um, Nagut, uh, and uh, Alexandra Manetz, um, and, you know, a huge variety of other people, uh, Malika Kunkov, uh, Baranyolo, um, say that if you take the operators defined by these correspondences uh, together with their adjoints, wherever they're defined, uh, these generate actions of um, uh, quantum toroidal algebras on uh, the corresponding moduli spaces of sheets. Um, so, um, in, uh, and this has sort of a limit in cohomology. Um, and uh, in if we're doing it in K theory and uh, either our moduli spaces aren't proper, um, or they don't admit a Kuna theorem, uh, there's some sort of modification that you have to do uh, to keep track of you know, not being able to push forward from them um, or to get operators uh, that don't necessarily come from uh, product of Kuna vectors. But this is not so important for what we're going to talk about. Um, then uh, now we're going to restrict to the T star E case and we're going to restrict to ordinary cohomology. Um, and we actually get uh, something even more in that particular case, um, which uh, says that um, the algebra that you get uh, has sort of an extended uh, super conformal symmetry uh, beyond the conformal symmetry that exists for any surface. 
Um, so the cohomology of the surface, because it's a cotangent bundle, is the same as the uh, um, cohomology of the elliptic curve itself. Um, and by uh, work of Nakajima Grzynowski, the uh, this uh, algebra that I described on the previous page is um, has a uh, subalgebra, which is the Heisenberg-Clifford algebra um, modeled in the cohomology of the surface. Um, and then in uh, you know because of the particular structure of the pairing of the cohomology on the surface, uh, we can actually get you know super cur currents extending the uh, um, Lorentz symmetry um, of you know the spin two current in the corresponding algebra to uh, super conformal symmetry by defining uh, the G plus and G minus operators according to these formulas, where these are uh, Nakajima operators by uh, particular cohomology classes. Um, then, uh, so this is all at, in, um, you know, non-equivariant cohomology. When you get equivariant cohomology, there's also an h-bar parameter that's uh, sort of floating around. Um, and then there are uh, uh, results of uh, Kruzig and Lunshaw that say that um, whenever you have this uh, super conformal symmetry and um, powers of uh, generators of spins, then uh, you get a map from the uh, what they call the super W1 plus infinity algebra on account of the fact that that algebra is generated by exactly those currents. And so um, in these particular cases, we get we extend our um, uh, conformal symmetry to uh, some sort of uh, super conformal symmetry at each of these walls. Um, right, so I think I've actually explained this page, which is that... Uh, you know, I said something about Gieseke semi-stable sheaves, but uh, in general, these are actually, um, you know, some sort of complexes. Um, and uh, the um, next step is to say for each of these walls, we get some sort of um, uh, interesting algebra that maybe in the T star E case contains the um, like super W1 plus infinity algebra. And then we want to uh, relate what happens is we have different walls. So we want to combine all these algebras into some sort of larger structure. Um, and the benefit of the fact that we're living in the uh, holomorphic symplectic world is that the uh, the cohomologies of all of these different moduli spaces are all actually um, isomorphic to each other. So for a general kolabi yau this isn't the case that if you have a birational transformation between them, then the corresponding uh, cohomologies are isomorphic. But for, um, yeah, K equivalent holomorphic symplectic varieties, we uh, we actually do get this fact, um, which says that um, yeah the the cohomology of the moduli space whose nef cone is here is isomorphic to the cohomology of the moduli space whose nef cone is there, um, which says that um, at the level of weight spaces, if we take the direct sum over all of our moduli spaces. Um, these uh, cohomology groups are weight spaces for a whole bunch of different algebra actions associated to each of the walls. So for each of these walls, we get um, uh, some sort of algebra that at least contains the um, uh, n is equal to two super conformal algebra, the, um, uh, some sort of representation of the su super W1 plus infinity algebra. Um, and uh, then we want to sort of relate uh, different chambers by um, these isomorphisms. Um, and uh, the way we're going to do this um, is by uh, using um, uh, wall crossing in the space of uh, bridge and stability conditions. Um, so we're going to choose a path in exactly the space of bridge and stability conditions, so a complexification of the last slide um, that avoids uh, certain singularities um, that are in complex co-dimension one or real co-dimension two. Um, and uh, work of Holper and Leisner allows us to associate um, a um, R matrix uh, that identifies the uh, cohomologies and K-theories of, uh, and actually even the derived categories of the corresponding moduli spaces. Um, so if we take the complexification of a slice of that story, uh, for each of the uh, real walls on this uh, space, we have a periodic arrangement of uh, um, uh, walls that occur in its complexification. And then as we choose a path um, within this complexified space, 
uh, we pick a choice of isomorphism between um, the cohomologies of the moduli spaces for one stability condition and the other. Um, and then associated to each of the walls adjacent to a given chamber, we get an action um, of uh, the algebra associated to those walls. Um, so in particular, a whole bunch of uh, quantum toroidal algebras um, uh, in the case where we have um, an elliptic vibration associated to each of these walls. And then maybe we have a whole bunch of other uh, real walls that give us um, you know, other algebra actions. Um, and then we're just going to take the algebra generated by all of those. Um, and uh, it produces some sort of uh, unwieldy algebraic structure that acts on the cohomology of all of these moduli spaces. Um, so in the uh, case for just uh, Hilbert's scheme of points on the cotangent bundle of an elliptic curve, uh, we at least get generators which are labeled by um, in the K-theoretic case, a triple of integers, and in the homological case, uh, a pair of integers, and then a natural number. Um, so associated to um, uh, each of the walls, and then each uh, multiplicity n corresponding to modification by n points in the derived equivalence frame, where uh, a sheaf of class um, A gets sent to the structure sheaf of a point, um, we get uh, a tower of generators corresponding to loops, positive loops in cohomological case, and then uh, positive and negative loops in uh, K-theory. Um, and uh, these generate some sort of algebra. Um, I expect that um, the... Uh, yeah, maybe I'm not going to finish that sentence. So the, the rest of the structure of the algebra is quite complicated. Right. So I said I said in the abstract that I was going to talk about R matrices and the way to construct these using R matrices, and I, um, uh, you know, ended up not putting those in the slides. But yeah, there is an R there's a, an R matrix construction, but you have to modify the theory in um, some sorts of ways. Uh, so basically, I expect. Um, so let's take uh, just. Uh, ordinary cohomology um, and um, uh, just uh, the T star E case, um, then uh, there are, um, for a, a single choice of R matrix, uh, we should be able to get a subalgebra that is uh, generated in particular slice of these together with their loop generators. Um, but um, that you have to, um, uh, there's an asymmetry in the R matrix that lets the entire theory not carry over exactly. But if you want to construct um, the co products of these algebras, you know, uh, a normal grand and a Interesting. So I, I'm not sure I know the, the way of uh, going from a quiver theory to a symmetric product. Oh, okay. Symmetric product of T star P1. If we did not do elliptic Thank you. 
Right. So hopefully, right. So hopefully, this will eventually follow from general theory um, that says that uh, you know always this extra loop parameter uh, really just comes from uh, the fact that when you have uh, the corresponding moduli stacks of torsion sheaves, um, all of these have you know this C star automorphism on account of the fact that they're just sort of shapes. Right. What is that direction that they always share? Or that I would say? Right. So that, that, that comes from the fact that if you take um that direction that they all share. Um, comes from if you only want to take uh, half of the um, algebra, so sort of some sort of positive half, and then you assume an isomorphism with a cohomological algebra. That comes from the fact that uh, moduli stacks of torsion sheaves um, are all uh, just isomorphic to. Um, your sort of moduli spaces um, of semi-stable torsion sheaves um, times so let's let's call this actually the stack um, of semi-stable torsion sheaves um, and then here's our corresponding moduli space um, times uh, BGM um, and then the uh, this algebra is conjecturally the same. Um, as the cohomological Hull algebra of modification by um, uh, torsion sheaves on your corresponding surface. Yeah, in this picture, it's all of the vertical direction. And, um, and this should all correspond to the fact that if you take uh, the cohomology um, of BGM, uh, this is isomorphic to. Um, over whatever base field uh, adjoined one variable. Um, and then if you take uh, the K theory of uh, BGM, it's isomorphic to K, uh, you plus or minus one. Uh, so I don't actually have a theorem that says that it works like this. I expect it to work like this. Um, and there, it will hopefully soon follow from general theory coming out of the school of people who study cohomological Hall algebras that it actually does work exactly like this, that it's uh, uh, a loop algebra into um, uh, uh, some, it's a, a filtered algebra whose associated graded is uh, polynomials or Laurent polynomials in a, um, a Lie algebra and the universal enveloping of a Lie algebra. Um, so, uh, right, so this is uh, a conjecture uh, in this particular case um, that it actually just really looks like we just have one extra direction. Um, so, uh, right, I'll, maybe I'll state this as a, a conjecture. Um, Right, yeah, 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 that would, it would follow from that, that's right. Um, right, so the, the conjecture is that um, this algebra that I'm calling um, UQ, say, GL1 um, hat, 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 
uh, is a filtered algebra and is you pass to the associated graded uh, is um, universal enveloping algebra of uh, some uh, Lie algebra, um, which is graded by Z mod two Z, uh, sorry, by Z squared. Um, and uh, around polynomials in that algebra, um, which would follow from uh, exactly this fact that the Weil group uh, preserves exactly those directions. Um, okay, and now maybe I'll very, very briefly talk about enumerative geometry. <laughs> um, and uh, Right, so uh, you know, rational curves in Lagrangian fibrations are um, extremely tightly controlled. Um, so, in particular, uh, if we're living over an affine base, like in all of these examples, um, we know that every rational curve actually lies in just one singular fiber. Uh, and the proof is that you know its image in the base is just a point because there's no rational curves in affine varieties. Um, and then finally, it can't lie in a smooth fiber because there are no rational curves in abelian varieties. Um, and, um, so that says that we can, um, you know, hope to understand, uh, what well, we know we can understand all rational curves just by studying singular fibers. And we can hope to understand singular fibers by understanding intermediate symplectic singularities. Um, so I'm going to leave this as, uh, kind of an, uh, interesting, um, exercise, um, which says, uh, that if you want to compute um, the correspondence on the surface that I drew on the first slide, um, so we have a correspondence in S cr cross S. Um, it's, uh, which consists of uh, points um, X and Y, such that uh, there exists a rational curve, um, which uh, might be a uh, chain of P1s um, mapping to S and um, uh, with, so here we have F and we have C, X and Y, such that, um, C P1, P2, F of P1 is equal to X, F of P2 is equal to Y. Um, and then the degree of F is equal to a class beta. Um, it's a fun calculation that you can do for beta corresponding to uh, some multiple of uh, the curve that just traces your smooth elliptic curve um, that uh, the naive class that you get here um, is exactly calculated uh, by a formula that you would get in a, um, uh, the algebra of loops of two variables into um, SL2. Uh, um, so uh, I'm not going to do this calculation, but it's kind of nice if you want to sort of see how the theory plays out. Uh, this one, so technically not covered by the equivariant examples. Um, oh, uh, composition. Yeah, so if you take... Um, <laughs> that's true. Right, yeah, I should have, there should be a circle there as well. Um, all right. Um, I, now I'm sort of over time. We ended four, right? Okay. Uh, so, okay. So uh, in the case where you have, um, you know, a holomorphic symplectic structure, especially one that scales equivariantly with respect to H bar, there's some sort of modification of romov witten theory uh, where all of your equivariant counts are actually multiples of that parameter um, associated to the fact that uh, you have deformations that kill all curve classes, but if you study them uh, equivariantly on those one-dimensional families, that family itself, uh, its deformations have curve classes, but all curve counts are multiples of H bar that scales that deformation. Um, 
And uh, that says that this uh, class, which is uh, the um, push forward of the fundamental class of the moduli space of stable maps, um, is a multiple of H bar. Um, then uh, deformation arguments say that um, the only contributions to Gromov of Witten invariants correspond to curves, which are dual to the walls that I've been drawing. So I've been drawing a whole bunch of walls in an upper one. The only contributions to Gromov of Witten invariants correspond to uh, uh, curves dual to those walls. Um, then we can understand all of those curves on the associated uh, quiver varieties. Um, so uh, each of the singularities has a local quiver structure and we know the curves um, on uh, every quiver variety. Um, and actually the, uh, we don't even know this at the level of spaces, we know it at the level of obstruction theory. So the, the tangent obstruction theory um, on the moduli space um, of curves on our surface uh, restricts to the tangent obstruction theory on the uh, moduli space of curves on the uh, analytically and or tau local quiver variety, which says that with the exception of the curves that trace out elliptic curves, um, all of our uh, uh, curve uh, correspondences corresponding to analogs of uh, things that are drawn the board for different degrees uh, lie in exactly the algebras that are um, uh, associated to the walls coming from local quiver structures. So you're saying the whole the geometry of your manifold near that wall is itself a quiver variety, or the the, the, the sheaves on it are uh, are representations of a quiver. What? I don't know about sheaves. So the sheaves are representations of a more complicated quiver. The singularities. So there's uh, if you take uh, on the M zero, take an tau neighborhood of a base, and on an M you take the inverse image of that. This is a tell or analytically locally isomorphic to the corresponding map from a smooth quiver variety to its uh, to M zero for the quiver variety. Um, and also, all of our curves except for those that trace uh, smooth elliptic curves um, are uh, contracted on exactly those contractions. The tangent obstruction theories agree, and so the correspondences that you get um, are exactly those that locally restrict to those that lie in the algebra for the quiver variety. Um, all that being said, we basically get uh, a description of the quantum differential equation on these moduli spaces um, in terms of the algebra on account of the fact that uh, the uh, curve classes uh, um, for contractible curves um, correspond to operators that we can describe on local quiver singularities. Um, and uh, we get a formula for its quantum differential equation exactly anal analogous to the quiver variety case. Uh, so as I've written on the board, this is follows from things that I've said, uh, but uh, right. So so the the fact that this is true for the trace of the elliptic curve class uh, is true subject to uh, a conjectural structure of the algebra and fairly minor details. So. A KZB equation. Um, maybe. So tell me, uh, what does the equation look like? It basically looks like a sum of a finite number of Lambert series. So it's some sort of. Um, sure. the, it, what you should be getting is just a generalization of what you want to to conform to open source. So I'm still in this report. I'll have to see if that's the case. I. Uh, yeah, I, uh, so you expect it to be a, a in the in the cases with there's a gauge theory that it corresponds to a uh, KZB right. equation for that conformal blocks in a torus for exactly the gauge theory. Yeah. Well, uh, not all of them will carry it all, because not everything will make sense. You have to have. It's exactly the thing that did happen now. So, so the way zero describes could carry it all and make sense for him, I think. All right. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll check that. So at least in in my cases corresponding to the I zero and I zero star cases, there is the gauge theory description, and that's a conjecture that could be checked. Cool. Um, and then there's uh, there's a localization formula that computes this, but it ends up being quite complicated. If you start with the gauge theory, like uh, so, gauge, so the one class of gauge theory, except uh, 
except you you want to restrict it, but those are the corresponding weight zero. I don't think that weight non-zero weight would make sense in a source, but if it's weight zero, it makes sense in a source. And these are these are these are just fine things there. There's quite quite a few of those uh in um uh you should be getting the different At Google, Google the chart. So, I'm going to use the Google the uh, but if you say kind of, uh, like you derive your power for, uh, but you do, you know, if you have like an extra loop, and if you do, uh, want to say that I'm going to allow my R matrix, a kind of product or my grand product of extra loop. So the time of the day, the first is just which is in a very small branch, and it's just in a very small branch. But this is the only kind of hybrid implementation I I don't see why it is that they all just kind of say. Because what is it in the code that you have? The first thing is the fact that you get, it's exactly what you show, it's just compactifying them. There, there's exactly one way to 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 uh to compactify the stream and to see all the paths uh to a source and you know preserving the uh, the, the 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 scaling of the of the more complex part. and this is a story it's semantic so there's nothing else we have to get that so they didn't they didn't so they were cool so they didn't want to tell me the way to do it before now this is this was cool to do so then we wanted to say that this is the oh sorry okay so then we, i think we're gonna we want to take off one loop first so um yeah so that, that's right the, 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 no no the hubris of point is in is, is not in the book there are the cube is kind of like that and on steroids i know but they come to you the same as a group uh which is Every time they have one, they're talking about this for this one. This little guy looks like that's the whole thing, you like kind of like a merge around the whole thing. All of these are kind of like low stage high frequency. Yeah, they're not going to be able to talk about it. You get the fact that you can talk about it, you don't have to go to the side. Yeah, sure. No, 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 it's not. The 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 point does not need to be used. It's only if you can use it. It's only if you can use it. It's only if you can use it. Yeah, sure. Okay. Are you um right and so basically the the story is that you uh have abstract theory that says that these operators converge with radius one radius one meaning that up until this point um on account of the fact that its coefficients are matrices whose uh uh matrix coefficients are bounded polynomially in terms of uh some basis and we're going to take the basis of nakajima operators uh which says that you know this is actually a nice uh well-defined uh analytic connection um uh and then uh, it analytically continues along that picture that i uh described before uh to a connection on um you know this uh, uh complexification of uh this corresponding space um some sort of interesting uh connection with regular singularities uh in this complexification of uh upper half space uh with um you know an uh infinite number of walls at uh complex co-dimension one uh loci um exactly corresponding to those loci um right and then the monogamy is described by the residues which uh agrees with um elements uh of the corresponding wall algebras associated with those walls um okay and that's all so uh thank you and uh happy to answer any questions
Did you say that you were somehow going to get uh, like supersymmetric extensions with like LDL two or something? Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there's this work of Kurtzig and Lindshaw says exactly that. Um, it's uh, on account of the fact that their supersymmetric extension of the W one plus infinity algebra. So at, a, at an n is equal to infinity limit um, has uh, some sort of nice description and it's uh, freely generated by some sort of particular choices. So to get a representation, all you have to do is show that you have, you know, uh, generators of particular spins together with n is equal to two superconformal structures. Um, so I expect it also to be related to uh, n is equal to four uh, extensions of this. Um, so I think, you know, uh, subalgebras of this algebra um, are related to, um, uh, you know, higher supersymmetric extensions of uh, W algebras. Um, also, okay, so I got a little bit lost on which enumerative geometry to do it. Uh, because on the one hand, you have some elliptic surface, then you also have some elliptic points on it. And then at the end, okay, you're, you're clear. What are the curves? What is M here? What exactly? Is M is one of these moduli spaces of uh, sheaves on an elliptic surface. Okay. Um, so it's, yeah, one of the moduli spaces whose neft cones uh, are in the swollen chamber structure. Um, and we're studying uh, equivariant chromov witten theory um, of those moduli spaces. Okay. So, oh, yeah. So it is this is a much fancier version of like. Uh, right, it's an exact analog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you take you take one of these curve classes that I'm calling uh, C two of two sort of moving points, um, and you take a, a neighborhood of one of those curves, the um, uh, you know obstruction theory and moduli spaces of curves in those spaces are locally analytically modeled by the corresponding moduli spaces of curves living in C two. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it, for those curve classes, it's not that much fancier than the, um, so for a, if you have a surface with no rational curves in it, um, then uh, the curves in its Hilbert scheme of points um, of curve class, which is a multiple of that C2 um, is just, uh, you know, maybe some push forward of the diagonal of, um, you know, a sum of uh, like Nakajima operators on that surface um, because every curve is just contracted by the Hilbert channel map. Um, if there are rational curves in your surface, then things get more complicated. Um, but if there aren't any, um, you know, it, it's not so complicated. So, you have to right so this was actually this example that i listed as an exercise uh Right. So uh, the simple answer to your question is no, on account of the fact that uh, there, the what you would get would be something like an I zero, I, uh, an I one singular fiber, uh, which isn't captured by this list. Um, so if you have, uh, you know, an, an actual chain. So in particular, if you don't, that's also not an example that's covered by this three loop story. So I gave you an example of, you can actually ca capture curve classes, which are multiples of the elliptic curve by breaking things up. But this is, th those examples are like non-examples of where you get through loop algebras. Um, so if you have, uh, you know, singular fibers that are uh, just of type uh, IK, um, then uh, this doesn't see those at all because that's when the J invariant goes to infinity. So um Maybe non-equivariantly, this exercise says that there's something there related to those. Um, so at the very least, at the on the surface itself, 
um, and not uh, the Hilbert scheme of points on the surface. It's certainly true. Um, but, uh, you know, the simple answer is that those are exactly the examples that you can't get. Um, um, no, I think it exists, but it exists uh, in some sense as like uh, like algebras that you get, um, I don't know, maybe at like particular values of h bar or something. So if you take one of these uh, surfaces and you uh, uh, deform the um, the j function so that instead of Uh, possibly, I don't know. I mean, I, I the uh, so you do if you take one of these surfaces with uh, you know singular fibers corresponding to J invariants of the cusps, and you take deformations. We actually saw a picture of this two weeks ago in Peter's talk of where you deform one of these D four singular fibers to uh, a, a union of two copies of this. Uh, so um, somehow, as you deform surfaces, you should get the, the uh, at particular at like a fixed value of H bar or something, you get some sort of two copies of uh, the algebra associated to an I2 singular fiber as you deform the, uh, you know, fully equivariant case of uh, D4. Um, so I think something like this should exist. But uh, um, to me, the most interesting stuff happens at, uh, at these cases at the, um, you know, where you actually have this full equivariant structure. Um, so uh, like an SL3Z yeah. action, um, uh, at a conjectural level, I sort of, there's, uh, it's interesting that you get sort of like a double cover of, uh, uh, analogous to the map from SU2 to SO3. Uh, that acts by, you know, doubling the anti-periodic boundary conditions on the uh, super W1 plus infinity algebra and also acts by the fact that you get the double cover of SL2 acting. That's right. Yeah. So here, because our coefficients are, are valued in the cohomology of an elliptic curve, we get an algebra that's... Uh, four times as big. So it's twice as big in the even space and as the same as, so it's the, our uh, root spaces have super dimension two minus two is equal to zero. Um, but uh, right, so in particular, the right action of SL2 acts both on um, the uh, SL2 of coefficients of the elliptic curve and the SL2 that acts on the, uh, elliptic Hall algebra um, in such a way that uh, if you ignore central extensions, you have to go around twice to get back to uh, uh, the identity. Um, the same thing happens sort of in these sort of flat algebras. Um, so here I know that at least at the level of vector spaces that uh, the SL2Z acts literally by derived equivalences on uh, the surface um, and uh, has this sort of same property that as you go around twice, it acts on the coefficients of elliptic curve, you get uh, um, the sort of same sort of thing. So uh, I expect these to combine to a, uh, you know, a double cover of SL3Z automorphism if you ignore all the central extensions. Um, but that's a conjecture related to the one that I erased or maybe covered up. Uh, but yeah, I, I know how it's supposed to act and it's exactly by, in the vertical directions, it's the W1 plus infinity SL2 with also SL2 acting on, um, I guess, by R symmetries um, on the super directions in sort of the vertical directions. In the horizontal directions, it just acts by derived equivalences of our surfaces. Conjecturally, this gives, yeah, double cover of SL3Z action on the algebra up to central extensions.
Testament.